Comic fam, we're back at the table like we do every week, but not to talk about spec, not to talk about movies, not to talk about donuts. No, we're here to talk about comic books because, you know, we'd be reading a bunch throughout the week. Weekly polls. It's the name of the show, so we're here every week. All right, so let's summarize how this show works because it's light spoilers. We'll be real. We're trying to get you into comic books, but we're also trying to get you to read them. So we're going to assess these stories based off of that premise and then bring you something on the mic that's entertaining, but also may introduce you to something new. We go over three comics every week. It's kind of the idea of this show. Only three issues? No. Well, it can be sometimes. Sometimes they're three issues. Sometimes they're four issues. Sometimes they're like 10 plus issues. Or sometimes, sometimes we read a lot. We, we, read, we read a lot of comics. There you go. Sometimes we bring friends on to talk to. Oh, that's right. Thank you for mentioning that. Shout out to John's Comics with Kids who's going to be joining us today on the mic to chat about some boom goodness. Actually, we're talking about more than one boom title today. Felt it necessary to bring my Power Rangers shirt out to the mic. Shout out to Rune. It's a good idea. Physical education is also a good idea. Dude, whenever... Like in high school, and I did my semester of PE, it was always throughout the month of May, which means out here in Washington, I don't know why, but it's a mile a day in May. So no matter what, if I'm doing my racket sports, because you know I like playing tennis in high school, I wasn't good at it, but I didn't like doing the other physical education. So I would try to do that kind of stuff, stuff that keeps you indoors, you know, it doesn't have to run a lot. I did swimming. You did swimming? You don't sweat in the water. Oh my gosh, I have sweaty. so many questions about Ryan swimming in high school. I did not was, know this. It was graceful and glorious to behold. Were you really good? No. I love to think about Ryan I was, swimming so dude, quick. I turned into like a merman in the water. Yeah? Jason Momoa great. over here. More or less. All right. Mostly well, less. We've been like joking about it, but you know what? We're going to get you in the water now. This is going to be a thing. We've been taught, chatting about you swimming more for the channel. We have. That has been a constant topic of conversation behind the scenes over here. <laughs> well, you know what? When I was in high school, mile a day in May is what they do out here. That so must have started after I graduated. It sucked, dude. And I was always like Thank PE, uh, the first period of the day. So it's like I get to school and I have to run. And I get all sweaty and then boom, go deal with that and then start your day. And then have all of school ahead of you. It was terrible, man. <laughs> no good. No. But at least I wasn't swimming because apparently Ryan was swimming. Side notes, though, because this is not about Ryan swimming today. Not today. Are you thinking about riding a Speedo? Because I am right now. Let's get into it. We have more than one boom book here today. One is really, really good. And one is really, really good to the community. But honestly, I think we have like, I, I'm okay. I'm, I'm saving it for the mic. But Save Ryan, I, there's one of these stories that we're going to talk about today. I could not get into, and I was curious whether or not you liked it. So I'm excited to chat about it. We are going to be talking about Strange Guys over East Berlin. Mm -hmm. All right. So stay tuned for that. If you've never heard about the book, no worries. We're going to get you there because this is a fantastic four issue series that came out a year ago. We also have Ice Cream Man on deck. I'm excited for that one. Get your Neapolitan. Is there ice cream? Get your sprinkles, did man. You, did you have, do you have ice cream? Get your falling man. We should have brought ice cream for this. Oh, it's going to be dope, dude. We should always have ice cream, oh, by the way, nearby or something. I've been waiting for a while to talk about ice cream, man. <laughs> Me too. We just haven't, but we're fixing that today, right now. And we also have Once in Future, and I want to start us out. Should we just do Once in Future first? Because, all right, I'm going to be real, Ryan. I, I, I was reading this comic book, Once in Future by Boom Studios. Right. All right. It, this, this book, first off, what would you say the community's perception is? I was just going to say, I feel like we have to start by explaining that we... At least I speak it for myself. This is new. I have not read this until this segment. Once in Future is a brand new book to me, but as part of the IG comic fam, it's pretty much impossible to get on Instagram and not see people talking about this book. A lot of people reading it. Everyone is in love with Once in Future. So I was, you know, I knew I was going to get to it eventually. I was buying variants of the comic book just because I knew people were interested in it. And I thought, oh, well, you know what? It's Boom Studios. I'll get to it eventually. I read this book right. and I'm thinking Ryan is going to freaking love this book. I don't know, but I, I can't get into this. I, I legit think that this is the first time I'm bringing a book to the table where I'm just like, comic fam, this is not for me. And I'm so interested to hear your response. I was thinking the same thing. No way. Yeah. Really? Oh, comic fam for real. I thought this conversation was going to be about how you like this. 
Oh, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. <sighs> I'm interested to hear your thoughts, but let's get, okay, let's go over the good. Let's go over light synopsis, light spoilers, you know, but really I want to get into why like, this like, wasn't for you. I feel like most people watching this will have seen, will have read the comic and we're the, we're the newcomers. We're the latecomers to the sure. game. We're, we were only going to read one through six. I, I went ahead and I read, I read all of it. It's only up through issue 10. It's a relatively, relatively new series. True. So yeah, not my thing. It's not my thing. I'm sorry, really like, legitimately kind of surprised. I thought you would like this I book. really wanted to. Because uh, everyone loves it. It's, usually, I don't go with what everyone loves, but I felt like this one had to have something. To, it looked cool. Like the art looks awesome. I know the story is is you know mythical and very very epic and important, and relatively you know it's historical based. Let's get into it. Sure. All right. How do you explain it? Because I feel like I, it's a it's a hard one. Okay, so we have a an archaeologist, right, and his grandma. Who turns out to be like OG, like old Buffy the Vampire Slayer to a degree. Surprise, your grandma is actually a vampire hunter. Yeah. I don't know. That that reveal didn't work for me. And I feel like a lot of your enjoyment of this series kind of depends really heavily on how much you care for this character. It's a cool narrative. I mean, it brings in like the mythological, the... Tales of King Arthur, Merlin, and really that's what the bulk of these first issues are about, is the return of King Arthur. Whether or not it's going to be a return for the good or the bad, though, is the concern, and it's shaping up to be a bad situation. There's like this group of shadowy evil types who conspire to raise the skeletal corpse of King Arthur from the dead. There's like some artifact, you know, some sorcery stuff. Some Indiana Jones type stuff is happening, and they bring him back from the dead. Turns out King Arthur is now basically like Black Hand from the Green Lantern, you know, Blackest Knight stuff. He's bringing a lot of other Arthurian knights back back to life, but they're basically zombies too, wearing suits of armor. It's pretty cool visual designs, actually, by artist Dan Mora. This team is actually quite strong. I mean, this is a, a fun book for sure. I get why people are digging it, but it gets very horrific, which gets me in. And then with the comedy aspect of this, it pulls me right back out. And that's where it lost me. That's why this isn't for me. Yeah. I've heard this described as a comedy book by somebody. Dude, Karen Gillan, dude. <laughs> yes. That's that's something that kind of frustrates me a little bit because we just talked about Die last week. And Karen Gillan was the writer of Die. And I went into this book based off of my love for Die. Kind of that was already, I was already pretty much on board. It was like, it was like okay. a serious level that we've had with this writer for a while now reading these books. And then all of a sudden, now that this is kind of a horror comedy. It's a horror comic. Brings it down to a different level. There's a weird comedic streak through it that kind of undercuts a lot of the horror for me. And I feel like whenever they mash those genres together, I'm reminded of movies like The Evil Dead and like campy kind of horror comedy movies and that never really does it for me it's like my least favorite genre because i'm a big fan of comedy but i like weird comedy like some of my favorite dark comedies are like the lobster or disaster artist or something like that but then i look at like my favorite horror movies and i'm thinking like hereditary the witch you know and Creep. creep of course and meshing those together it's like it's either going to be something along the lines of like Shaun of the Dead, which is kind of what I'm getting here yeah. a little bit or funny. You should mention that, actually. Why? Because uh, I read further than you and the creators actually make an appearance. They make a cameo appearance like the hot fuzz because they made they made hot fuzz. So they're dressed up as their hot fuzz cops. And it's clearly the you know, it's the cops from the movie Hot Fuzz. And they get taken out by. One of the zombie night guys. It's pretty, it's pretty funny. Okay, so seriously, there you go, though. It's like you see why this is all kind of like put together in a way that if you're a really like diehard, morbid horror fan and you're into like some weird comedy, this is, this is definitely like lighthearted. It's fun. But I just wish it was a little bit darker and more serious. Agreed. But let's see what John from John's Comics with Kids has to say about this. Good idea. Once in Future is so awesome. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> I knew you'd like it. All right, comic fan, we got John from John's Comics with Kid on the mic, community member, and I'm very excited to have him on. Hit that like button. And John, hit us with why you love this comic book. You know, I'm, I, it may be my British heritage or what have you, but something about this book, the, the sense of humor, I mean, it totally reminds me of Shaun of the Dead, which I'm a, I'm a big fan of the whole Cornetto trilogy, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz. I mean, this... 
really has that same sensibility where the humor is like understated, the genre is overstated. So you get this sort of like sci-fi horror on the front line. I think it's really well done. I, the art for me kind of like kicks it up a notch. The color work is phenomenal. And I, you know, if, if you get a chance to even flip through the pages and look at all the way they use the colors and the hard black lines, I think it really comes across as being dynamic. All things I, I think I agree with, except for the, uh, what trilogy? I don't even know what you called it. I, I don't like Cornetto, those movies. Yeah. I don't care for those movies at all. And I think that might be maybe why the series didn't speak to me. What credit I will give it is its pacing, man. I, I dig how much you see in short little panels and then they just change the scene. It kept me interested. I mean, I was going page to page. Uh, I may not have been enjoying it to like the full potential, but I got something out of that. That might be one of my biggest issues with this story is that I felt like it moved way too quick and I didn't have time to like attach to any of the characters before they were getting like whisked along and carried along on some grand adventure that that was just happening to them, it felt like. And and I was kind of drawn along for the ride and maybe forced along for the ride is is a better way to put it because I didn't have time to like catch my breath or get my bearings even. Which for me is kind of a fun, right? Like the fact that they don't slow down for anything. Um the grandmother, I think, is a riot. For me, it's like a British Betty White. Like, I just see her, you know, I want to see her carrying around giant machine guns and shooting at people with sniper rifles. I think she is hilarious with her caches of bazookas and things. She is amazing. And all the comedy comes from the sort of uh, odd partnering of her and her grandson. And that's that's really beautifully played against this horror nightmare of king arthur returning from the grave i really dig this protagonist that we follow because her grandson is like the opposite of what you would think she would be you know like you don't expect the grandma to be this badass is slayer but you would imagine her son her son's fit he's this like slim guy and he's 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 dealing with his hands but no he's the nervous one he's the he's kind of the old person of the group that's a good point. The roles are kind of reversed. My whole, my biggest concern with this comic, this run, is like I feel like I'm just wrong. I feel like everybody else that's is what, right dude, about this okay, comic. That's what I feel like too, Ryan. That's okay. why I needed John I'm on really here. Scared to like I'm really scared because I'm be this against this comic, but I don't like it. And everybody loves Once in Future, and I'm really concerned that we're gonna get like a bunch of thumbs down and like angry comments on this one. But. Let us know, comic fam. What do you think? John clearly is laughing at us because he's he's feeling that uh, right now. But I think it's hilarious that, that Ryan is willing to at least acknowledge I'm clearly missing something here. And the fact that I think maybe you mentioned that that movies like Shaun of the Dead are not your British it, cup of tea. At least those might movies be, might be part of that. When I when I'm watching those movies though, I at least understand that they're a comedies going into it and all throughout. I'm like I'm laughing more than I'm scared, which is, I think, part of the reason they don't speak to me on, on a film level. So I would rather watch a horror movie than a comedy. I would rather be scared than laugh. When you mash them together, the, there's always some kind of dissonance. And for me, this comic, there, w there wasn't enough uh, comedy elements for me to even really uh, call it that in my mind. I liked, I liked the, the dialogue and the banter that was, that was going on between the grandmother and the grandson most of the time. It was very comedic in that sense, but it felt more like comedic relief from all the undead, like crazy epic happenings that are happening everywhere else. Yeah, I could definitely see that, but I think it needed that layer. Like uh, like Tom was saying, the, the, the odd sort of role reversal of son and grandmother, which is kind of explained later, his sort of innocence uh, is important to this plot. Um, but yeah, you definitely have to have a layer of comedy to make the horror, which is beautifully rendered, like not as just overwhelming. Well, John's got that graded 9.8 die behind him. And I think that's where I was kind of left a little disappointed is that I was hoping that some of that serious, you know, role playing type of narrative, you know, they're talking about some like fantastical things, but it's also some deep, you know, emotional stuff that these characters are all going through. And then I walk into this story, hoping for at least a little bit of that, seeing the horror being excited that, oh, it's going full horror. There's some like disturbage, disturbing imagery here. But then, yeah, it, it's it's left with, oh, it's all kind of for a gag to a degree as well. It's frustrating because I don't hate this comic. If it, it'd, be, it'd be easier to like talk bad about it if I was like really against it. I just, 
I don't like it, and I feel like there's room for me to like it. I'm just not there yet. So maybe maybe once we keep going, maybe maybe once the second trade, maybe maybe there's maybe there's room there for me to grow into it, but not yet. What is really cool about it is the way they kind of steep it in British literature lore, and the King Arthur legend is used so well in the first trade, and I think the second trade does a great job of bringing in other classic sort of British fiction, and that's hopefully a, a, a way they'll keep going with this story. Comic fam, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Are we crazy? I think I got to keep reading it. Hearing John talk about it, and I'm, and I'm like, now I'm like going back over it in my head. Like, all right, if I'm just like, give it the... I just want to ask him what other British book he's talking about right now. I already want the spoilers, but I think that's... It's got a good segue, actually. Kind of like historical fiction. Let's chat about that, because okay. I'm talking like genres and comic books. And this next one... Another Boom Studios goodie. So we got a we got a really good one here. One that I'm actually really excited and proud to bring to the community. And I'm glad because Once in Future didn't really get me there. But this comic book, Strange Skies Over East Berlin, takes you through historical fiction, sci-fi, and horror. And then it's done. And it's brilliant. Four issues. Sometimes that's all you need. Let's chat about those genres. Well, you know, I, I have a love for true crime. I have a love for historical fiction, sure. But like what what I love is sort of the way in which you can layer things in comic books. You kind of mentioned that idea that you don't need to stick to one lane. And being able to, to pull key pieces from all of them makes for a compelling read. This is one of the prime reasons why I respect the medium so much because you can't do this in movies. You can't do this even in cartoons. Being able to create something, a new story in such a quick amount of time because you're putting it on pages allows you to do things that no other medium can. And these four issues are a great example of that. What's it even about? I feel like we should we should lean into that. This is a comic I feel like a lot of people, I I never heard really anybody talk about this as it was coming out. And since it was only four issues, it kind of came and went. You want to know who right I heard talking radar. about it? Hmm. I heard John talking about it on his channel over at John's Comics with Kids. Oh, yes. They did a whole breakdown of this as this was coming out. And they were going, why aren't other people reading this? So it's how I got into this story. I got them as they were coming out. One, two, three, four. And I never read them in, in true Ryan style. I read the first issue and I was like, cool, that's fun. And then I waited for the you know the, the second one. Never read it as it as it you know started piling up second third fourth and then I just kind of forgot about them and and then uh, we're talking about them now so here we are. How would you explain what this introduction looks like because it changes so quick by issue two? To try to put something that seems so brisk into uh, a short sentence is complicated when it is so vast and so this is centered around the Berlin Wall. It's centered around the time in which we had a ton of spies through Europe, all countries sort of trying to keep information one from another, and specifically one spy who gets wrapped up in a little bit of espionage and a ton of aliens. A tale from the past based in reality with these protagonists trying to escape Germany. And you're introduced to a spy story. You're introduced to something that's political. And by the end of issue one, yeah, an alien shows up. And now we're about to go basically like Ridley Scott alien. You're in a bunker and you're stuck with an alien and you're dealing with it. Well, and, and that moment you're talking about climbing over the wall. It's, it's so you've seen it in movies before and you have that drama of escape to freedom. And in the midst of it, this this sort of comet streaking across the sky as if to say, nope, this is not just historical fiction. We got this other layer here. Probably my favorite panel or like spread in the I don't want to say that it's it's a it's an early contender. But there are some really gorgeous like splash pages and full page shots all throughout this comic. There's a lot of good color work that is done, particularly with the alien later on. So I don't want to say this is my favorite you know, the, spl the splash page of the of the meteor coming in, but it's it's a highlight of the first issue for me, at least. It definitely makes you stop going, wait, this is going in a completely different direction. And one of the things that I, I get into most with short stories like this is the ability to get us to, like, have a cliffhanger so often. And I felt like that every few panels, because we're following a bunch of characters, we're learning to care about these characters. It has almost a Walking Dead vibe where you're being introduced, you find a story, you get, you hear their narrative, and you, as soon as you start to care, boom, something is just pulled from under, underneath you, and you don't even know what to expect next. 
there's a lot of great sort of uh, touchstones that you can see the creators had in mind, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, the body snatchers, uh, whether that's, you know, uh, 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 The Thing, which is one of my favorite sci-fi horror kind of blends. They, they clearly have a lot of touchstones for those kinds of things. Uh, and then great, just good spy storytelling. Even the covers have sort of a pulp spy novel style to them. Let's get into the art because I would say that this is very much experimental, like the stylistic. It's the detail is like purposefully off. You know, you have like scribbles in the back. That's like, yeah, that's people. But this is seemingly painted everything. I don't know how they do it, but I, I really love like like you mentioned, there's a little there's a scratchy kind of rough scribbly nature to the the fine details. I noticed specifically like certain panels with people's hands and like stuff that you would expect a, a, a different artist to kind of maybe spend some more time on and make sure you get it right. And these are more just kind of like rough suggestions almost. And it's very loose, but that just makes the kind of well, hey, it makes the shadows which I feel like deserve their own separate category, the shadowing and, the, and like the shading and all of the dark inky stuff. It makes all that stand out more too. But then when you get specific and you get shots of this alien coming out underground in this bunker with that, they're all trapped in together. The, uh, the jarring loose kind of scratchy images really kind of hammer the, the, the horror home, you know? The art for me is a wonderful way to kind of like dive into the themes of the book, which are secrets and lies sort of like, where is reality in all of this? The character is constantly trying to keep things from one another. And if the artwork had the same sort of clean line work of once and future, it would totally sabotage the story. I like that they are sort of hiding things in the artwork in a way. This slow burn, dark narrative, plus this art style, like combining together. Yeah, the sci-fi aspects are now able to be shown to a new degree. And it brings me back to like the classic sci-fi days of, of like my youth of being just rattled by the dark, being rattled by, is there a presence that's accompanying me in this hall? Is there something lingering? Can I hear something? And I'm reading these pages feeling that, but there's this also this like character development that the narrative takes you down and you're learning about so many different characters about their past, about what they're experiencing in the present and why they're acting and choosing to carry about the decisions they're making in this in this comic that you, you kind of forget that these are people who are petrified. These are people who are sweating and they're waiting to die. That's something that ties this back into the historical fiction nature is not only are they stuck underground with this mysterious alien, but this this narrator, this protagonist, we're in, the, we're in his head and he is a professional spy. And he's basically got a running monologue the whole time of like, don't get caught. Don't get caught. They're looking for me. Everyone's out to get me. Don't get caught. This one guy is definitely out to get me. Don't get caught. Don't get caught. And so there's like all kinds of claustrophobic and panic and just oppression feelings coming at you from from kind of all sides in this story. I'm super excited that you guys enjoyed it because I wouldn't have found it if it weren't for the like weekly book club doing with the White Whale Comics. And he he read it. He said it was amazing. So then he got me on board and then we ended up reading the whole thing and just doing this. I think it just a, is a book people might have missed. Shout you know, out to White Whale too. Best beard in the game. Right? Sad to say, yes. <laughs> Well done, sir. He gave me a lot of good beard tips back when I had one. And, you know, our, our lost friend Edwin was part of that, too. So it was another great community member. It was a great way to kind of just every all the people involved on our, our community that, that were reading this with us uh, were finding it because it got lost in these great Boom Studios books like Something's Killing the Children. And this little gem, I feel like because it was only four issues, because it was so abstract and unusual, it was it was overlooked. That's why we have this video happening every week because there's just too many awesome comics to even keep track of. And with the community's help, if they had the subscribe and that like button, well, we'll be here to cover more. And as always, geek responsibly. Didn't even notice the covers of these comic books. I had to like wait till I saw them all in front of you. Strange skies over East Berlin. Once you get them all four laid out and look at them, uh, apparently that's what it took for me to realize that the characters are on the covers. <laughs> Of the comic. Imagine that. Very experimental art, man. Like, this is, like, very unique, and you kind of lose out on what you're actually seeing because there's so many visuals there's to like take in. There's, like, three or four images inside each portrait of the people here. So you're, you're looking at a few different things. So it's okay that I didn't get it 
right away. It's why we have to come to the table, man, because exactly. the community is like going to be here with us and they're going to notice stuff that we don't notice. You're, we're going to notice stuff that we don't notice and they're sitting right here in front of us. And that's why I also have like cool members like John who can accompany us on the mic. Yeah. Strange Skies was something special, man. The creators did a really good job. It was written by Jeff Loveness with the art by Lissandro Esteban. And I'm going to be following Lissandro because this art is so unique that I'm excited to see whatever else they get matched to. Because if it is horror, if it's sci-fi, if it's like, like historical fiction, it's going to be dope. It's, it's interesting to say, but like I can't imagine them drawing anything other than this is so like unique and just specific to their talents that like anything else. I'm just like, how? You know, what's that going to even look like? Like, you, I'm on I'm on board. I think people are going to be surprised about this one. And another one that we're going to be chatting about right here, right now, is Ice Cream Man, which mm-hmm. I believe, you know, from Image Comics, they're only on issue 20, 21, right around there, that this is easily the biggest surprise fan favorite when people don't know what this comic book is, and then they get introduced to one issue. It takes typically one issue. Hopefully, it's the right one. You know, sometimes it may not be the right one. It may turn them off. It's kind of like Black Mirror. You know, there's this there's this overall respect to the whole franchise of this weird sci fi horror narrative that you may stomach one that you don't really dive into too much. You're not really digging. But overall, you have a large respect for it. Like the one Ice with the pig. Man. Yeah, like the one of the pig. You know, you don't want to watch a dude do a pig. You can call me fam. You know what I'm talking about. By the way, that's the worst example of, a, of an episode to start a show with, you know? I can't believe they made that the first episode of this, like, Netflix series. I kept know? going after that, but I was a little like, oh, this Interspecies is... commingling. You don't really want right. to get into that. But I digress because Ice Cream Man has nothing to do with that. We have a horror anthology that is so damn good. One of my favorite ongoing comics that I'm currently subscribed to. I can't think of a of another anthology comic that's coming out right now if there is one let us know in the comments because that's probably my favorite aspect of ice cream man is is that every issue is its own story so you can just if you want to jump in cold pretty much anywhere in the 20 plus issue run that they've had up till now and get like a complete story so what's fun about this one is that we're going to be able to dive into light spoilers and we only decided to read like the first six issues for the mic today. And because these are an anthology, they're all different stories. So we can do this like light conversation and still give you something that's worth picking up, not just worth reading, but collecting as well. Like these are works of art. Every one of these comic books is something special, which is why there are so many people now just finding out that I got to go pick up all these issues. The art's something special. It's uh I feel like it deserves its own video almost at this point because it's it's not often that like you could give me this comic with no words and I would still get really really spooked out just even from the relatively normal scenes of like people eating ice cream and walking down the sidewalk there's just something like off existential surrealism man yeah it's trippy that's 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 a really really easy word for it, and it almost doesn't do it justice. So we were chatting about some like horror vibes we were getting in the last two different ongoing reads we're covering, and this one is a completely different type of feeling when you read it. This is a book that you're gonna read, and you're not gonna feel well by the end of the pages. And some of you may go, "Why would I want that?" You know, and that's the same members of the community who may not understand horror, you know, like the Polito horror, the Benti horror. But there is an aspect of leaving a comic book and feeling dread, feeling disturbed that I am hungry for. Am I weird? A little bit. Every now and then, that's okay with me. But there were a few issues of Ice Cream Man. After closing them, you're just like, ooh. Well, let's start them out, dude. You know what? Let's start them out with Raspberry Surprise, okay? Because this is the first issue of the anthology. And I think the beginning sequence, the first seven or so pages is very much like an introduction to the theme of what we're about to read. Introduction, meaning like the false sense of security that you're given. I'm talking about the Brazilian spider. Yeah. Okay. So like walk us through the first few pages of issue one. The the feeling I got from it is it's, it's the scene of a boy buying Ice cream. From, Simple. From an ice cream truck. Normal. 
like we all did as little kids in the summertime. Happy. Right. You, you, you hear the ice cream. You run through your screen glass door. You're starting at issue one. This is your first exposure to all of this stuff. And you're not technically supposed to be on edge yet until you start reading the uh, the dialogue. It's It's a narrator. And it's basically just reading like an encyclopedia, basically, definition of this venomous spider. This Brazilian spider, we learn about how grotesque it is after it bites you. How you, how the different ways people typically die and how gruesome it can be. And you're learning over time as you're just watching a child enjoy ice cream and walking through the streets. It doesn't make sense. And it's really creepy and confusing because you're on the one hand seeing an otherwise normal just kid walking home after buying an ice cream cone and reading about a deadly spider and people dying from like erections that just won't end. Sounds horrifying. So we find out that this narrator is kind of like the crypt keeper of this tale. And we also have an anthology where nothing's really connected, but we do have characters that tend to show up in other issues, whether it be in the background that were in other issues. So there is a loose like connection that is unfolding. It seems to be taking place in one town, right? They're, they're kind of, not that clear on that, but I'm getting the vibe that these are, yeah, they're loosely connected short stories that I think are, are weaving a, a giant tapestry of this small town that this otherworldly supernatural ice cream man slash demon guy is kind of like haunting. Well, we find out within a couple issues of this series that there are two characters worth noting. There's the ice cream man who is someone who has decided to kind of like make their persona look like like he does like like a, a seller of ice cream this is by choice because there is a protagonist someone who is seemingly the opposite of this character because he is portrayed as an antagonist there's a lot of horrific things that he's causing or at least he's indirectly allowing to happen and facilitating there's also this cowboy a, a, a cowboy named caleb that is kind of the opposite of him who is there and saying, I know what you're doing here in this town and I don't like it. Now that sounds like a good amount of a plot, right? But that's legit. The only plot you get really for like a dozen issues. And it, it happens in the background in the, in the fringes of like one or two issues over the course of a couple of trades. So it's real thin connective tissue, but there is, a little, a little thin framework connecting all of these stories together. If you, if you want to, if you want to read them in order and pay attention to that stuff, it's there. But what I love about this story is that it's completely unnecessary because every one of these issues is standalone and they're unique, not just in their narrative, not just in their art, but even the way they're constructed. Oof. We're moving on to the second one then. I think we should, because the next one is called rainbow sprinkles. Now, this right here, you know, when comparing it to the first issue, I mean, the first issue you're hit with like supernatural stuff. There's monsters, right? There's poisonous spiders. There's death and, and, and a lot of other stuff that will that'll intrigue you. But then by issue two, you have an entire narrative about addiction. Yeah. Sadness. Death. This is the point. This is the point where reading Ice Cream Man where I realized like, okay, like this is a different comic. Like the first issue is a, it's, it's, I don't want to say normal. It's, it's kind of fantastical, strange. though. Yeah, but that, that kind of horror is something that's a little more prevalent, I guess, in, in comics especially. But then you get to issue two, and it's just this self-destructive story about this like junky couple who are all strung out on their couch and reminiscing about like how their lives just slid downwards into this present state that we find them in. And it's very real. <laughs> and that makes it really really uncomfortable and scary in a in a completely different way than the first issue was and that i think is when you start to realize the true kind of brilliance of ice cream man as a series is that each issue shows something horrifying and you weren't really expecting it you don't you don't ex you don't know what to expect every every time you open an issue of ice cream man you know it's going to be horrific in some way but in this issue too it's horrific because of how they handle the theme of relationships how they handle the theme of escapism and and it ends with just sorrow it, it makes you feel sad it makes you feel down and you're left with going holy smokes that was a quick 19 pages 
Right. And there's no real like happy ending to that one. It's it's like I said, it's very real. Like that that is that is people's story in real life. That happens and that just makes it like all the more like powerful. Okay, issue number 3 here is when it really picked up for me though, because issue 3 is just bananas, dude. I mean, the Beatles basically show up. I mean, not the Beatles, but the Yellow yeah. Submarine. We have a, a lot of Beatles stuff in this issue. That's for sure. These creators respect certain things in music, certain things in art, and they bring it into these stories. And this tale is called Good Old Fashioned Vanilla. And it's about someone at the kind of point of their life where they're realizing that they're past their prime and the rest of what they're you know living for is just boring and regret which to me is the worst fear that i have that's scary is regret this guy was a rock and roll star in his youth and he was a one-hit wonder and nothing he did ever after that would ever match up to the one song that he was incredibly famous for and he spends the rest of he spends his old age kind of just hanging out in a diner drinking coffee by himself he had a one-hit wonder you know and he's very proud of that but that was it and now he's just living the rest of his life, you know, over just a cheap cup of coffee. And you see this like this unique story and I won't give any of the reveals away, but it's about that. It's about actually coming to terms with it and being faced with reality about what you can do as a human being on this earth in this short time that you have. And I also really want to highlight probably my favorite panel in these entire six issues because again, the ice cream man—he he plays a role in these. He come, he's he's in and out, you know. He's just the some keeper. of them. He's more directly involved in the events, but a lot of them, like this issue specifically, he'll kind of just pop up and when you're feeling down, he'll kind of just tweak you and jab you just a little bit to make you kind of cry while you're already like bleeding out on the floor. He'll just twist the twist the knife just a little. And in this short couple panels, you see him interacting with our lead character of this issue. And the characters venting to the ice cream man. Ah, I had a one hit wonder. Heck, they they were they were they translated my my lyrics in other countries. Like there's there's He had to learn a whole different language. It's Portuguese. Like, yeah, to know? record in, in Portuguese. And the ice cream man has one panel where he says something seemingly in Portuguese. And the reason why I know is because I translated it on Google Translator and I brought this back to you after I read it because I wanted to know if you did what I did the first time forgot, reading it. I forgot that panel even happened. I, I just skimmed right past it. I was like, oh, he said, I assume that's Portuguese, but I was so wrapped up in the story, I just I just kept going. I didn't think to put it in the internet, but Tom did. In the throes of just like him venting and him talking about how his life could have been so much better and this, this protagonist was a star. You could have been like Elvis. He, heck, he translated his lyrics to Portuguese. There's people in Portuguese singing my lyrics. The ice cream man says this very quickly, Falcomer a pele de sus hijos. Very quickly. The, the protagonist doesn't even notice that it happened and keeps talking about his music career because that's really what he cares about. He's kind of self-centered, yeah. you know? He's, he's, he's so down. So I went to Google Translator. And what does that mean? I'll eat the skin of your children. Ah, I don't even know if they talked about him having kids or any, anything like that, but it's just a weird, creepy, throwaway line that's like, I'm going to eat the skin off your children. Hardcore, man. Like little snippets. It's like the Brazilian spider. It's like, hey, we're just going to add one panel to cause just dread to just fall all over your body as you're reading this. And it's almost subliminal in a way, too, for people like me who didn't bother to look it up. But, you know, it, it's, it's just something weird and creepy and like not right that he says. It doesn't fit. Next one I want to talk about is issue number five now. This is called The Ballad of the Falling Man. This marks a change in the series because right here you see the writer getting hyper creative. Something about these two issues in particular, uh, you can kind of tell the creators are hitting their stride. you got the writer W. Maxwell Prince and the artist Martin Morazzo. They're kind of getting into their groove here, it seems like. They're getting experimental here because the tale of the falling man starts out with a gentleman committing suicide, jumping off the top of a building. You know what's going to happen. And the story takes place as he's falling down the side of this giant skyscraper. And you're seeing what he experiences. You're also seeing as he goes down and passes different levels of his work, what horrific things are taking place on these different you know, floors. It's a really out there story. And... It's almost, for me, I think it might be the hardest one to explain out of the ones that we're talking about here because you got this relatively simple, you know, man falling 
you know, he falls off. He'll, he dies at the end. You assume one follows the other. But then, as Tom was saying, inside the building, as he's falling down, you've got all these weird, very dreamlike kind of scenes of like carnage and murder happening inside the room. There's like a, a, a creepy shot of a board meeting happening with a vulture like pecking out people's eyes. And mm-hmm. nobody really seems to be paying much attention or noticing. It's about the nine to five, man. It's about going to work. It's about having your life be about the a, grind. a job and the grind and something that isn't worth living. Thus, it's not worth living to this character we're watching fall to his death. Yeah. And that's that's one of the scarier parts of this issue, too, is you, you kind of know what's coming. And every page you see him getting further and further down the side of the building and the things he's thinking are just like, oh. I shouldn't have cheated on my wife or, oh, I've done all these horrible things with my life. And, you know, I, I've kind of I've made the final decision and now everything is just kind of happening. It's kind of it's a it's a it's a it's weird. This this whole this whole series, man, it's just every issue. It just finds a new way to, like, make you think about life in, in a really in a really new, almost almost too bleak kind of way. But then there's other issues that make you think about it in a completely different way. So a whole trade of this of this story is like such a weird sandwich of emotions and feelings. It's it's completely unique. Like Ice Cream Man stands apart. It really does. So then we get to issue six, which was my personal favorite of what we've read. And officially now we have the creators looking at this opportunity to write a unique story uniquely every time and in a way that the the reader is going to do like a scott snyder style you're moving the comic upside down type of thing because this story is called neapolitan and neapolitan has typically three different colors right you know that's what it's about it's it's based off the flavor of ice cream neapolitan which is chocolate vanilla and strawberry all kind of mashed into one different choices right just like in life you know you have different choices you go down one path maybe you find love maybe you go down another path and you find a companion, like a dog. And maybe there's a third path that you go down and you find nothing. How would your life be different in those three different examples? And what we see in this one issue is all three of those paths being shown at the same time. This is about the most experimental single issue of a comic I may have encountered in my entire life. Ah, uh, it's, love you, it's dude. up there. It's up there with <laughs> Batman five from, from the new 52. When you, yeah. like you were saying, when you're turning the comic upside down to kind of mimic Bruce Wayne losing his mind. This is something similar where you get another kind of like the first issue where you get somebody just buying an ice cream cone and walking down the sidewalk and then you turn the page and it shows you three different panels vertically and there's three different paths that the guy takes and throughout the whole rest of the issue every page every page is split in three different chunks and it's colored differently so you get three separate it's like a choose your own adventure almost you can just follow like I, Tom and I actually read this issue differently. I was surprised. I was wondering how you would read this because I like reading it the way that it's presented. Show me three panels from here, three panels from here, three panels from here, and I'll remember. You know, this right. one happened there, but it can get a little confusing, right? Especially if you're me and your memory sucks. So I, I made the decision once I found out that's what was happening. I went through and I read all of the top section first, like the one story of him, you know, having a having a wife and a kid and a normal life of sorts. You know, and then you, and then I flipped all. Once I got to the end, I flipped all the way back, and then started doing the middle path, where he meets this dog and has a you know another another kind of. That, that, in my mind, that's the happiest one of the three. And then the third one, I don't even know where to where to begin with that. That's the horror element of this issue of Ice Cream Man kind of factors into this third uh, alternate path that the guy could have taken. The theme of loneliness, the theme of really all of us being alone when it comes down to our existence on this planet. And it makes you think. Comic fam, we had a lot of emotions this week. We want to know if you're reading Ice Cream Man. We want to know if you're reading Once in Future. What do you think about Strange Skies over East Berlin? Let us know in the comment section below. It'll enter you to win a giveaway. We have a Wolverine in Hyuk Lee Comic Tom exclusive that could be yours. And, as always, geek responsibly. Enough said. Greetings, comic fam. I'm, I'm glad that you made it. I'm glad you watched the whole thing. You made it, and this is your reward. You get a special message from me, Fire Guy Ryan, saying thank you. Don't forget to hit that like button, because I always forget. And while you're here, you should probably check out some of this other stuff that we made, too. We do this weekly polls video, like, every week, because it's called Weekly Polls. Last week, we talked about Daredevil and Die and Dollhouse Family, so you should watch that one. Or you could check out this video we did on White Ash from Scout Comics. We talked with Perry from Perry Comics. It's a good time. You should check them out. 